Hello there, Config. We're from Zendesk in Melbourne, Australia. My name is Bo, and I'm a product designer. Hello, I'm Emma, and I'm also a product designer. Hi, I'm Rachel, and I'm a content designer. And today, we want to talk to you about something deceivingly simple, design pairing. Design pairing happens when a designer and someone else from a different team, be it another designer, an engineer, someone else, jump on a call and share the honest messiness of their creative process, often with a cup of tea in hand. It all sounds basic in principle, but it's what's going on underneath this simple weekly ritual that makes it such an interesting point of discussion in this cultural moment of hybrid and post-pandemic work we find ourselves in. To help me unpack how design pairing came to fruition, yes, that's the first of many fruit-based puns in this talk, Rachel, Emma and I are going to step through what happened that caused us to kick off this experiment in the first place, why we think it's useful for your work, and how you can take this idea into your own hands to strengthen not only your designs and product, but your work relationships as well. To start off with, we need to lay the foundations as to why two people intentionally designing side by side has such a different weight to it in 2022. A lot has changed in the last few years. For what should feel like it was just yesterday, 2019 may very well go down as the last year of normal work. And let's be honest, it feels like a century ago. But even before the pandemic hit, a storm with a very little S was kind of brewing in our own team, and it was starting to spread us thin. Our team was scaling and becoming more distributed, not knowing who to ask for X, Y, and Z, unsure of what people were working on, separated from our colleagues by vast oceans and time zones. I'm sure these are familiar experiences to a lot of us. Renewed discipline in both circulating work and forging meaningful connections was required so we could ensure our product looked like it was coming from a cohesive group of thinkers and also so we could feel as though we knew one another as colleagues on a level beyond pixels, despite the time zone. Structures had been put in place and culturally we were seeing this diverse team of creative thinkers work with and come to know one another really well. But then the pandemic hit and we found ourselves removed from the social spaces of design thrown into a working from home model. Novel at first, however, removed from our communal style of working, the slippery slope into our own echo chambers of creative disorientation and doubt had began. And doubt, when you're trying to design something, is a horrible feeling. This is how I've personally felt at certain moments over the last two years, like I've been thrown into an Edward Hopper painting. It's an image I'm sure we can all see ourselves in, the loneliness and melancholy captured in his work has mirrored our physical and mental selves of late and our professional climate in a lot of ways as well. For decades, great design has been done around tables, pens and paper, and relationships. Architects, industrial designers, even early software designers, our design ancestors in some ways, they all worked in social spaces where trust was born, vulnerability slowly grew, and critique became an organic occurrence in discussions. Likewise, our modern day open offices have been designed for us to assume a public posture, which has us naturally moving into shared spaces for both interpersonal and work-based incentives. What are we to do when we aren't sitting at the table anymore? Two years or so into the pandemic, untethered from our usual way of working, we've at times moved from public facing design to inward facing design. It's become a bit too easy to turn work into a single player game. When we're together, we design for our world, but as silent individuals, we run the risk of designing for ourselves, which leads into problematic territory concerning bias and diversity, just to name a few. So with all this in mind, we had to try something new. A lot of old structures and processes struggled to meet us in the season we found ourselves in. Historically, these checkpoints have provided great benefit to the team, larger group workshops, critique sessions, and so on. But with interpersonal connections struggling to forge, trust levels diminishing as a result, and Zoom fatigue hitting us like a tidal wave, speaking in front of 20 plus people on a Zoom call, some of who, for new hires, didn't exist in 3D yet, wasn't high on people's wish list. So what did we try? Well, we tried this thing called design pairing. Design pairing is an intentional, recurring co-design session where two people work their way through the chaotic moments of the creative process. Before screen sharing kicks off, these calls start with acknowledging the human in front of you, even if time is short. A simple, what's new? Taps into something a lot of us have missed over the last few years, knowing what's going on with one another. Then the sharing starts. 
The point of this call isn't to show the glossy stuff straight away. The point is to deliberately show up where you and your work are at. Be it completely lost, confident, anywhere in between. Just be real. Don't be a work bot. <laughs> Sounds pretty great, right? Practically, what does it look like? Well, it looks like this. The standard Zoom call and screen share combo. This is Christian, by the way, the content designer I work with. We're in our Tuesday morning pairing sessions, complete with his signature pink markup notes. This is the kind of messy sharing we're talking about. It could be a Figma file like this with arrows and sticky notes. It could be 30 variations of the same freaking wireframe because you've spent the last few days wrestling with indecision. It could even be before visual design has taken place, like this Google Doc that maps out the experience as a conversation between Zendesk and our customer. Design pairing celebrates the mess and helps us refine our work and thoughts via its nonlinear social nature. From spending time getting to know someone on a human level to unpacking the wider narrative of what we're working on to finally zooming in on very specific design problems. These calls curate an environment of unguarded sharing where your partner becomes familiar with your problem space and your favorite band, as an example, and a sense of psychological safety paves the way for deeper sharing to take place. There's more to it than just making the design better. The screenshot before doesn't quite tell the full story. It doesn't show that we open these calls chatting about our weekends, families, music, books, and so on. It doesn't show the legitimate, how are you going? Which inherited a whole new weight to it during the height of the pandemic. Deliberate moments of authenticity. So how does this help us make better products? It's easy to hear better products and go to places like great UX and UI, scalability, reliability, and so on. But behind these good things is a collection of stories involving unsung heroes. These are some of those heroes which may go unnoticed despite being foundational to getting a group of people excited and empowered to design something bigger than them with one another. I can't help but think that behind any great product is a team that has invested in one another via some of these attitudes we're touching on. Happy people, happy product. We think design pairing is part of the new way of working. I personally look forward to it on my work calendar, especially when this tomfooler is going down. This is Sonia, Rachel's greyhound. She's performing what the doggos call the cockroach. There's nothing more traumatizing than seeing what you think is a dog fighting for dear life in the background when you're trying to listen to Rachel's content design wisdom on a call. Small, funny moments, but they truly build something great. With that out of the way, I'll pass on to Rachel herself as she further explores the why of design pairing. Thank you, Bo. Sonia says hi, by the way, and she looks forward to traumatizing you again in our next session. So why is design pairing a worthwhile pursuit? Let's go a little deeper into what we've discovered over the past year or so of experimentation. At Zendesk, we have over 100 product and content designers, and it can be hard to stay across what all those other people are working on. Pairing helps us connect the dots with other projects and get a sense of how those other designers are solving similar problems. That means we spend less time reinventing the wheel and more time doing meaningful work. If you've ever taken part in a larger review session like a design critique, you'll know that they're useful for many things. But often, there's only time to share minimum context for your work, resulting in a whole bunch of reviewers who understand just the surface level of what you're working on. With design pairing, consistently, you end up with one reviewer who's able to dive deeper and get a more comprehensive understanding of your work. When your partner is armed with all that knowledge of your problem space, you get more considered feedback, ultimately leading to more thoughtful design work. Beyond all the designers we work with, there's also all the cross-functional partners we connect with as part of our process. And the great thing about design pairing is that it isn't bound to the people with the same title as you. Anything goes with this simple framework. Pairing with these folks can st help strengthen important relationships and also give you a better insight into how other disciplines work. Everything I know about Figma I actually learned from my product design partners during a pairing sesh. Let's talk productivity. 
Often, the meetings in your calendar become roadblocks to you getting your work done. And with remote work bringing more meetings than before, carving out the time to do your work is harder than ever. I know that when I look at my jam-packed calendar at the start of the week, I feel totally overwhelmed. But when I see design pairing in my calendar, I don't think, ugh, another meeting getting in the way of doing my work. I think, great, now I might actually get something done. Because pairing is a meeting in which you actually do the work. It's a real working discussion that moves things forward and results in tangible outcomes, ultimately speeding up your design process. In her book called Content Design, Sarah Winters describes pair writing as a way of getting through both the first and the second draft simultaneously. Pair designing is no different. So let's go back to design critiques. Sharing the messy inner workings of your mind at a crit can be difficult at the best of times. Now add in remote work, Zoom fatigue, and all the other fun stuff we've come to know and love over the past couple of years. Any feelings of intimacy, camaraderie, or safety that you might have felt while sharing a physical space with your reviewers is now harder to find. With that wall of passive Zoom faces boring into your soul, you'd be forgiven for feeling anxious, underprepared, and ready to chew your own arm off to get out of there. But with pairing, there's zero prep needed. Just show up as you are. Your partner is there to help create order from the chaos and figure it all out with you. Think of a design pairing as training wheels for your bike. It's a safe space to learn, fail, and explore, ultimately helping you feel confident ripping those bad boys off and moving into the next stage of review. So you, you end up getting clarity while staying comfy. We've all been there. You notice someone creeping on your Figma file. Your heart begins to race. Panic sets in. As designers, we're often predisposed to showing the pixel-perfect designs rather than the mess. But there's so much to gain from getting comfortable with sharing your work and also yourselves, maybe even oversharing if that's your thing. With arriving at a place where we can allow ourselves to get messy and let it all hang out. And pairing offers an intimate space to build that vulnerability muscle, ultimately leading to a mutual feeling of trust and psychological safety. Because when there's trust and psychological safety, everything becomes easier. It's easier to relinquish your perfectionist tendencies, guilty, and show imperfect work. It's easier to verbalise the stuff that keeps you up at night, or at the very least, keeps you from getting your work done. It's easier to admit to the imposter syndrome that you might be feeling. More often than not, you'll find that your partner feels the same way. Our colleague Marta claims that design pairing has been her top aid against overthinking. Personally, my top aid against overthinking is watching an Adam Sandler movie, but pairing is a close second. Design pairing is also one of the places that we now do the important relationship building work that more structured meetings don't allow for. Share Netflix recommendations, meet each other's pets, have an impromptu book club, stave off the social isolation that so many of us have experienced the past couple of years. It's not just about the work. This is where the water cooler moments now happen. That's a water cooler, by the way. Um, no one understands my art. So in a nutshell, what we've discovered over our year of experimentation is that pairing is good not just for your work, but also for your soul. Which means that we have a host of new unsung heroes to add to those that Bo mentioned earlier. And we're starting to see all the surprising ways in which design pairing 
can sneakily contribute to making better products. Here's something I learned about Emma, hello, during our pairing sessions. As you can see, her son is a gifted artist, but also maybe low-key hates me. Uh, if you can't read, read that speech bubble, it says, I don't care about your friend. I'll try not to take it personally. Let's hear from Emma now on how the rest of the Zendesk team feels about pairing. Spoiler, they definitely do care about it. That is right. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Rachel. I think, I think that's because you're not part of the cool club. But uh, maybe I can send you an invitation afterwards. Anyway, back to the talk. So it seems like people are starting to catch on to design pairing, and rightly so. Our friends at Zendesk have been trialling this process for the, over the last year, and it turns out they feel the same way about design pairing as we do. We care deeply about creating big impact and it shows here in these numbers. When we surveyed our team, it was revealed that 100% of them felt more connected to their teammates since pairing. And 75% of those chose the highest level of connection on our five point scale. Oh, say hi to Chris, he is one of our UX researchers. Connections aside, Cindy here shares her sentiments towards the benefits of pairing, and it's a key ingredient to a successful design. She says, good design is the outcome of thoughtful consideration, experience, discussions, and of course, trials and errors. Cindy gets the value of design pairing, and it turns out the rest of our team does too. Overall, the feedback has been incredibly positive. So let the pairing experiment continue. So as we know it, COVID added another layer of relational detachment. Zoom fatigue is a symptom we've all felt with a move to remote life. In fact, Google tells us that turning our camera off is a very common search request. And as I delved deeper, I discovered there are so many hacks we can do just to avoid being seen. But when our cameras are switched on and we are truly seen, this is where the magic happens. Relationship philosopher Esther Perel tells us that true vulnerability between two people is not a mandate. It's a possible outcome that grows out of closeness and trust. But being ourselves means we have to be brave enough to trust others. And trust isn't something that's built overnight. So how do I make it happen, I hear you ask. We can make it happen by understanding and modeling our relationship green flags. When we see them, we often feel safe, heard and validated and comfortable to be our amazing selves. So relationship green flags are the positive signs to look out for during design pairing sessions. When they are present, they provide productive, respectful and meaningful discussions, setting us on the path to pairing success. Here are just some of the examples we embrace here at Zendesk. When it comes to connection, we want to take the time to get to know our partner. And when it comes to design, we share our work no matter how scrappy the design is. We lean into embracing friction. It makes us better designers and we build better products. And when you make time for fun, as well as doing the design work in the session, 
It's the ultimate green flag value bundle. Design pairing leaves you feeling connected, productive, and energized. Okay, I am not going to lie, being vulnerable is really hard. It goes hand in hand with fear. And I think fear is something that needs to be normalized. Our friend V talks about how you're not going to die when you do public speaking. And the same goes for this. You're not going to die in design pairing. I remember in my first few weeks at Zendesk, trying to understand everything, insert brain explosion emoji. Instead of telling Bo about my messy work, I wanted to take the opportunity to show him the work. I mean, take a look at my design files. When I first started pairing with Bo, I had millions of questions, trying to understand technical terms, intentionality, grid systems, and components. What I liked about these sessions is that we were comfortable enough to say, hey, I really don't know the answers to this thing, let's work it out. So in the end, I didn't die from design pairing. In fact, Bo saved my life. And when you bring design pairing into your process, these unsung heroes become major players in the orchestra of product design. Okay, I know we've covered a lot just now, but I wanted to recap on where we are today. We all know the way in which we work has changed forever. This, folks, is what I have been wearing for the last 237 months. My COVID fashion mood board includes exploration of textural fleece, vibrant colors, oversized pockets and elastic waistbands. But that is not the cultural reset we're talking about here. This is the cultural reset we're talking about. Design pairing is something you can start today, well, maybe after config is wrapped up. Here's what's worked for us. Just find a partner, set up a meeting, and show up. Simple. But the beauty of design pairing is that it can be anything you want it to be. Customize this template and do what works for you and your pair. OK, I will now pass you on to the person who saved my life. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, but before I do, there's something you have to know about Bo. He makes really cool keyboards. I'm not really sure what the fancy dials do, I'm sorry, um, but I'm totally here for the design. So here he is. Thank you, Emma, for broadcasting my weird fascination with expensive pieces of metal and plastic for the world to see. I have no shame though, shout out to the mechanical keyboard gang, especially the Zendesk crew. As the saying goes, no idea is new. In art history, towards the late 19th century, salons and cafes were hubs where creatives and thinkers gathered to share their work. In 1920s Paris, novelist and art collector Gertrude Stein opened her salon to the likes of Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, Picasso and Matisse. The space she created enabled them to engage in open discourse about their work, which impacted their art. It was their own moment of escaping the echo chamber. Have we, in 2022, come to a new salon moment where designers look above and beyond their buddy on Slack to their wider workplace and creative circles instead? Has hybrid work given us an opportunity to come full circle and make design more of a social exercise than it has been in recent memory? Let's be real, design pairing, in essence, is a simple method of open thought and screen sharing, nothing groundbreaking. However, everything about its core nature represents inherent value. The forging of authentic human connection, the emerging of trust and vulnerability through those connections, and how these facets make us feel safe to show what we think is messy and bad and know that something great will come next. Together, these qualify as cultural hallmarks of teams that create better products. All you need to do is find a partner, make a regular meeting, and show up as you are and see the fruit that comes out of these sessions. To our friends at Zendesk, Zendesk, thank you so much for helping us bring this talk to life and your investment in us. We hope our pun-based humor didn't push you too far. 
And to Figma, thank you for inviting us here to SF to speak. We're so grateful. And finally, thank you viewers from all around the world for joining us today. We're looking forward to seeing where design pairing leads. Try it in your own workplace. And if you do, reach out to us online and let us know. We'd love to hear your stories. We hope you enjoy the rest of Config.